<laughs> as we know, people talk about the emergence of space time and quantum gravity. So I just did a quick Google search and I got these passages. Maybe you can guess what these are. But um, it doesn't really matter. The point is, people talk about emergence of space time and quantum gravity in general. In, uh, in string theories, where's the string theories? Here. Uh, in many approaches to quantum gravity, in a non perturbative description of quantum gravity, I put the names up, but it doesn't matter. We can um, use set quotes too, though. You, oh, you that was you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was you. <laughs> We didn't have two state quotes, so we won't. So, I did too. I really <laughs> use your quotes. But in some ways, the question of whether or not this is the right, this is the right language to be using. And I have just thought the whole time that, at least Chris and Nick, that I've been aware of been talking about emergence of space time and quantum gravity, that they didn't really mean emergence in the sense that philosophers have been talking about emergence, and scientists have been talking about emergence for some time. And uh, so what I thought it might be useful to do is just to review the kind of standard way philosophers and scientists can think about emergence uh, since there were, you know, since the rise of emergentism in the 19th century. And I'll say a little bit to contrast this with typical accounts of reduction. So emergence is supposed to be the, and, uh, a failure of reduction. I'll say a little bit about that and how, uh, since the mid 20th century, we've seen accounts of reduction as being pretty flexible, that you don't really have to go all the way to emergence in order to capture situations in which uh, you don't have the, maybe the smoothest reduction. And then what I would like to do, as Chris said, is just start a conversation about what we think about the status of space-time and the various approaches and whether these should be thought of as cases of emergence. So, there are some theses that are very typical amongst people who, who call themselves emergentists. And some of these are epistemic theses, some are metaphysical. I think typically uh, amongst emergentists, it, it's most common to hold all of these, all of these theses. Whereas maybe uh, some, there are some people who would say they're emergent, but they don't mean anything metaphysical by this. It's still just a lot to these epistemic theses, but the epistemic theses themselves still carry a significant metaphysical implication. So let's just, let's just talk about these briefly. So when you're talking about emergence, usually the first thing that comes up is some kind of predicted thesis. So emergent features are supposed to be not predictable from some kind of exhaustive information about say, fundamental domain or uh, um, some basal conditions. By contrast, uh, results, and so we'll be using as a standard <laughs> the philosophical discussions of emergence, we'll be contrasting emergent features with mere resultant features. Um, I'll talk more about what, that, what exactly that's supposed to mean, but by contrast with the emergent features, resultant features are supposed to be uh, predictable from lower level information. Now, here when we talk about pre predictable, we have to keep in mind, we don't mean just inductively predictable. So, if you're an emergentist and you think that, say, consciousness emerges some, from some fundamental, uh, let me start that again. That if you're an emergentist and, thinks that con and you think that consciousness emerges from some kind of complex arrangements of microphysical features, that doesn't mean that you think that each time you have a kind of, uh, a certain kind of complex arrangement of microphysical features, it's going to be a complete mystery whether consciousness is going to emerge in that situation. 
usually the view is there is a, so for example, uh, in the moods when David Chalmers is, a, is, is an emergentist, there's going to be, the thought is that there is some kind of configuration of microphysical features that gives rise to consciousness. And so once you learn what that is, each time you observe those features, that arrangement, you're gonna, you, you can say, oh, there'll be consciousness in this case as well. So you have a kind of inductive predictability, but what you don't have is a theoretical predictability. So there's something about the microphysical features that just in the first case, you wouldn't be able to look at those microphysical features and be able to deduce, no matter how much of the microphysical information you have, whether or not you get consciousness in that case. It might be that the microphysical features don't give you um, enough information about, about consciousness. They're framed in a different, a completely different vocabulary. Uh, there might be different reasons for this. But the thought is, is that it's not, it's not a kind of inductive unpredictability. It's, it's a theoretical unpredictability. So I think that distinction is useful here. And then explanatory. So emergentists, and we'll see this is common to all of the, all of, all the emergentists, think that emergent features, unlike the mere resultant features of complex uh, configurations, they have to be causally explainable in terms of their basal condition. So if you're going to, if you believe that there's some kind of emergence, you're gonna think that, again, there's gonna be a regular behavior. So there's gonna be a regular correlation between maybe the microphysical features and whatever you think is emergent. But this kind of regular behavior is not gonna be captured by the laws of the basal features. You're going to need new laws that are gonna capture these stable correlations between the, uh, the basal or if the microphysical or microphysical features and the emergent features. So we'll, we'll see this, uh, Mill, uh, Mill talked about heteropathic laws, we'll see you know, Broad talking about uh, transordinal laws. All right, so these are, these are the uh, epistemic theses that are usually associated with emergence. Now, you can also adopt metaphysical ones, and I think this is, this is very common, uh, at least in the, certainly in the philosophy of mind literature, when you see uh, people discussing emergence or uh, endorsing emergence, they're, they're going to have, uh, they're going to keep in mind these metaphysical features as well. There are some in the philosophy of science literature that are say, well, no, we just need a kind of epistemic emergence and we'll just talk about this. But I did want to emphasize, you still have novel thoughts. Uh, so like Anderson, uh, uh, Moore is different. I mean, he's explicit about, about this also. And legal. So uh, the metaphysical theses are just, Adding a little is if you don't have to adopt both of those, not all emergentists do. There's an explanatory thesis again, but then this explanatory thesis is different from this one in that we're not talking about causal explanations, but instead metaphysical or what metaphysicians would call grounding explanations. Uh, I don't know if the emergentist, the emergence literature is caught up to the grounding, uh, the grounding trends in, in metaphysics, but I'll put this in here. Usually you see. Uh, the thesis stated as emergent features, unlike those are, that are merely, merely resultant, are neither metaphysically, or they'll, they'll say, are neither explainable nor reducible. But what they have in mind is in the kind of causal explanation. I mean, that's true too, but also a metaphysical explanation. So if you knew everything about the microphysical features at a time, that wouldn't tell you that there was this kind of emergent, emergent feature. But for all this, they're no less fundamental. They're no less fundamental. That's, you, you see that as well. We'll come back to this issue about fundamentality towards the end. Uh, okay. Uh, it, and it's, well, it's because of the fact that they don't have a metaphysical or grounding explanation that they have to be seen as equally fundamental if they're going to be real. And then this thesis, so often emergentists believe in a kind of downward causation. So they think that there's a unique kind of causal efficacy that the new emergent features bring with them. So the emergent features are not just uh, 
fundamental and not predictable and not explainable in terms of uh, grounding or uh, basal features. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't say grounding. In terms of the basal features, uh, but they bring with them new causal powers of their own. So this is a, a causal efficacy thesis. All right, so we'll see not all emergentists have this as well, but this is generally thought to be like the default position because if you're going to think that there are these new features, then if they're epiphenomenal, right, if they don't bring with them new causal powers, then you say, why? Why should I believe these? Awesome. I'll say these theses are often formulated in terms of emergent properties. I just wrote features instead here because we're interested in space time. So. Uh, but I think that's all. So let's go back to uh, British emergentism. So I had on the reading list this paper, this amazing class, uh, classic paper by Brian McLaughlin on the rise and fall of British emergentism. So I know there was a huge reading list, so I don't expect that anybody read this. I, I'm going to have a couple of long passages so we can see how he thinks about British emergentism. Uh, all right, so there's this first, there's this first thought, and I'll, I'll just read this. Apologize for that. I'll try to read that uh, slowly. According to British emergentism, there's a hierarchy of levels of organizational complexity of material particles that includes, in ascending order, the strictly physical, the chemical, <coughs> the biological, and the psychological level. There are certain kinds of material substances specific to each level. And the kinds of each level are wholly composed of kinds of lower levels, ultimately of kinds of elementary particles. Let me just say this. This is, a, this is an important part of what is distinguishing, what distinguishes emergentists from dualists, substance dualists, right? The thought is still that we're just dealing with matter. It's not like there are new kinds of substances, souls, uh, vital substances that, that are emerging. You still just have material particles, but it's there are going to be new features right, and as you have more and more complex arrangement of these particles. Okay, so, a uh, wholly composed of kinds of lower levels, ultimately of kinds of elementary material particles. Moreover, there are certain properties specific to the kinds of substances of a given level. These are the special properties of matter. And it's part of the business of a special science, meaning not the physical science, the, the complete, jet, most general science, to study the organizational relationships peculiar to a specific level and to formulate laws governing those relationships. Okay, so that by itself is not that interesting. I mean, that's, you can be a reductionist to think that. So he says, well, these views require further explication, they'll no doubt seem familiar enough. What's especially striking about British emergentism, however, is its view about the causal structure of reality. Oh. oh, here we go. Okay. British emergentism maintains that some special science kinds from each special science wait, can be wholly composed of types of structures of material particles that endow the kinds in question with fundamental causal powers. Subtleties aside, the powers in question emerge from the types of structures in question. Such a structure will have an emergent causal power as a matter of law, but the law will not be reducible to or derivative from laws governing lower levels of complexity and any boundary conditions involving the arrangement of particles. These laws emerge from the laws governing, this is, so this is just, I don't know why he just repeats the, the same point, but I thought it was important just to remember this, so I put in the, the repetition. <laughs> These laws emerge from the laws governing lower levels of complexity and boundary conditions involving the arrangements of particles, and so are in no sense derivative from that. And here's a striking point. They endow the kinds of the power to influence motion in ways unanticipated by laws governing less complex kinds and conditions concerning the arrangement of particles. Emergentism is committed to the nomological possibility of what has been called downward causation. Now, what we'll see, the emergentists he discusses don't all accept that there is downward causation, so that the emergent properties have effects on the, uh, on the behavior of uh, individual particles and their well, trajectories is mostly what he's thinking. 
Uh, but there's still the nobological possibility. So it's compatible with the laws that there be this kind of downward influence, whether or not there actually is a downward influence is something that British emergentists differed about. I'm not gonna talk in detail about all the British emergentists. This is like, I highly recommend the paper. I, it's, it's just like, it's, it goes through each emergentist and talks about what the differences were, what they were, who was new, what's very confusing still about some of them. But I'm just gonna highlight Mill and Broad briefly. So Mill doesn't use the word emergence. So McLaughlin talks about Mill as the father of British emergentism, but it's not that he actually uses the word emergence. The word emergence, uh, at least in this discussion, in McLaughlin's discussion, it looks like it's coming from a later uh, emergentist, Lewis, and then gets picked up by C. Lloyd Morgan and then C. B. Broad later on. But what Mill does have is this distinction between what he calls homopathic effects and heteropathic effects that then get picked up by the, the later people who are calling themselves emergentists as resulting features and emergent features. So when he talks about resultant features, and so we'll see this, we already saw this on the very first slide, this discussion of emergent features versus mere resultant features. When Mill thinks about resultant features, he's thinking about basically features that can be viewed, yes, they're features of complex systems, but they're features that can be viewed as just vector sums of the uh, more uh, simple systems. So this is, this is Mill uh, from Logic. He says, in this uh, system logic, he says, in this uh, system logic, I don't remember, I, I got this from the document. In this important class of cases of causation, one cause never, properly speaking, defeats or frustrates another. Both have their full effect. If a body is propelled in two directions by two forces, one tending to drive it to the north and the other to the east, it's caused to move at a given time exactly as far in both directions as the two forces would have separately carried it. And so you can think of this as just like, you've got your original boss still operating. It's just like one after the other. So he says to just continue the passage. It's left exactly where it would have arrived if it had been acted upon first by one of the two forces and afterwards by the other. I shall give the name of composition of causes to the principle which is exemplified in all cases in which the joint effect of several causes is identical with the sum of their separate effects. Okay, so you're just dealing with the with one set of laws, so we've got a complex, uh, a complex situation. The emergent features for Mill, well, he doesn't say emergent features, he says a heteropathic effect, which is the effect of a heteropathic law. Um, and here, Mill, like the other British emergentists, the, the main example, one of the examples of an emergent feature were chemical features. So they thought uh, that the laws of chemical reactions could not be explained in terms of the laws of physical, physical components. So they were emerging just about chemistry as much as they were about biology and the mind. Uh, so heteropathic, when he's talking about heteropathic effects, this is where the principle of composition of causes fails. The concurrence of causes is such as to determine a change in the properties of the body generally and render it subject to new laws more or less dissimilar to those which it confirmed in the previous state. So, so we're dealing with new laws, and you can see this gets picked up also in, in broad. Yes. How important is it? I mean, there were sort of two definitions of a uh, homopathic one. So, one is that they work as a vector sum, and the other yeah. is this more complicated thing. You could have done one and then yeah. the other and get the same thing. So, is, are they, those don't seem necessarily the same. Is the time yeah. one sort of important? I think it's just the thought is that you can decompose the effect into processes, in, into these individual processes. Uh, so you can decompose it at a time and look at, I mean, I'm, he's, yeah, he's thinking of, you can look at it as the, the force in this, in this direction, in the eastward direction, we can think of it as, as a force in the northward direction, and then ultimately the movement of the body will be a sum. That's a decomposition. And then you can de it, he's thinking of it as you can also just decomp. I, I'm thinking he's thinking of those, I was thinking he was thinking of those as the same thing. So when you decompose it, you think, well, there's this, 
and there's and there's this. They're both going on at the same time, but it could have equally well been the case that we had the, the, the northward component and then the eastward component. I, I can't get into I mean, I can't get into the <laughs> Well, I can't get it. I don't want to get into no exegesis yeah. here. But okay. Let me let me tell Let's me if go. this no no. But tell me if tell me if this matters. I think I mean what I'm taking from this that is that is what the later emergentists took from it was that you don't have to introduce uh, new laws for complex systems. So you can just think about um, you can just think about laws the laws of simple systems as being added up for um, so you've got you've got a system where uh, you have you have these different forces coming from these different particles but we could we don't have to say oh so we're in a complex situation where you've got these many different particles so now we have to use new laws you think no you look you use the same law that you were using if you were just dealing with two particles and you just add, you add up all their effects. And so, in the, whereas in the case of chemical reactions, he thinks that's not what's going on. You can't just use those laws that you would be dealing with in simple situations. Now there have to be new laws. So there's new laws about uh, combustion, how that works. There's new yeah, laws about- Just a single point. It doesn't yeah. seem to me that sort yeah. of a way of adding causes maps the same as saying you could have done them sequentially. The same. Okay, that's- Those seem like two different things. Yeah, that sounds like two different things. So I, yeah, and I, I have no idea if he thought they were two different things. It's just there's one claim and then there's the next claim. <laughs> I mean, the passage sounds very like you on the because of the parallelogram or the, the addition of the Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's clearly where he's getting that. <laughs> uh, okay, so Broad, so Broad also talks about commitment um, to new laws. He doesn't talk about heteropathic laws. He calls these transordinal laws. And then this is picked up by um, Nagel in uh, the Structure of Science when he's uh, contrasting reduction and emergence. There would be two fundamentally different kinds of laws which we might call intraordinal and transordinal, respectively. A transordinal law would be one which connects the properties of aggregates of adjacent orders. A and B would, would be adjacent in an ascending order if every aggregate of order B is composed of aggregates of order A. And if it has certain properties which no aggregate of order A possesses and which cannot be deduced from the A properties. And the structure of the B complex by any law of position which has manifested in itself at lower levels. An intraordinal law would be one which connects the properties of aggregates of the same order. Okay, so you can look at systems, so in like um, the Putnam, uh, Oppenheim and Putnam picture in, uh, of uh, the unity of science as a working hypothesis, they're looking at science as broken down into levels where the levels correspond to a decomposition of entities, right, from one level to another. So you have this ordering in, in uh, what did I say, Oppenheim and Putnam, of the levels where the objects of chemistry are completely de decomposable into parts that are in the ontology of physics. And the entities of biology are completely decomposable into parts that are all entities of uh, chemistry, okay, and so on. That's, that, here you get this level hierarchy. But here, this is something else. So when Broad is talking about different orders, you see uh, what makes something another order is that uh, every order, aggregate of order B is composed of aggregates of order A, but if it has certain properties with no aggregate of order A is possessed and which cannot be deduced from the A properties. That's not how, that's not how Oppenheim and Putnam are thinking about this in the unity of science, right? They're thinking that this, is, this gives you reduction because you can deduce the properties of the chemical things from understanding the properties of the physical things and so on. So this orders, orders uh, hierarchy is, is, is different than this one uh, that Broad's considering. So the transordinal laws are going to be relating 
uh, emergent, right, emergent levels. Now I'm just done with the quotes here. <laughs> so just summarize. The British emergentists, and you can see this, this comes out clearly uh, in, in, uh, in McLaughlin, endorse the supervenience of emergent features on, on base features. So although you have these new laws, we're still thinking so that there can be no change. So if you have, uh, let's say, these are your, your, you have emergent features P1, it can't be the case that you have P1 and then some emergent feature E1 in one case and some other emergent feature E2 in another case. There is going to be supervenience where this is all at, at the same time. There's going to be supervenience of the emergent features on the basal features. But the emergent is different about the issue of novel causal power. So that's something that I already, I already talked about. So you, you have to have these, these transordinal or heteropathic laws. But whether or not, when you have this new feature, this, this, this new heteropathic feature, that necessarily is bringing with it new causal powers, or these are epiphenomenal, that's something that they can disagree about. All right. Uh, I want to give just, put on the table just another, another picture of emergence that is not uh, the same as British emergentist picture. So the British emergentist picture, um, I mean, this is compatible with the original emergentist species that I had on the first slide. But what's different about the picture of Tim O'Connor and Han Huang from their paper, The Metaphysics of Emergence, is that here you don't have supervenience. And here, the emergence relation is specifically thought of as a diachronic relation. So you can see this in, um, I was lucky that I could grab this picture from Google, uh, which is from their article. But uh, there are a lot of arrows here. <laughs> but here you have uh, a physical feature that is causing an emergent, uh, it causes, right, at a later time, uh, another feature to emerge. This is, a, this is an emergent feature. Now, for the continuation of this emergent feature, you have to have uh, the physical feature, which is this P star, I think it's a star. Uh, that always has to be present. So this, these uh, thick arrows are, are just talking about the uh, persistence over time of the instantiation of this feature. You can't, it's not like once you get the emergent feature, it can just be it's free and it doesn't need any kind of physical feature uh, to sustain it. It does. So at each time, you know, you have the P star generating E at this time. If you're going to have it E at this time, it still has to be that there was a P star at the previous time that was causing it and so on. Uh, but now, another thing that you can have in this picture is uh, what they call super emergent, super emergent features. So you have P star causing the emergence of E star. And then E with these kind of physical uh, sustainers here as a whole will then lead to this new super emergent feature, E star. So you get these new causal powers. You have these new, new properties that get brought in onto the scene because of the emergent features. And so that's something that I was like, Tom. Yeah, I was puzzled. So how do you distinguish <laughs> between these two different causal features? Why is it just not causation? It is causation. So how do you distinguish between the two? What do you mean by the two? Do you mean this and the British emergent test, or? No, I mean, the, isn't the the point that this is some sort of um, unproblematic expression of um, downward causation? Where oh, there's downward causation too. Oh, are you asking? So how do you distinguish? Are you asking about the this, which I didn't talk about yet, or I, I don't know what you're asking about. Um, how do you? Okay, maybe just carry on. No, 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 continue with your question. <laughs> no, I just, I don't, I don't understand how you, so it seems to me you would be saying, okay, I've got causation at the lower level and causation at the upper level. They're operating at different time scales or something, and that's how I'm distinguishing between them. So I can say that there are two levels at which causation is operating. So is it, don't you need to distinguish between two levels at which causation is operating? To, to talk about emergence? So I think this is what, what they're doing with the P's and the E's. 
So the peas, they're, they're, in this picture, they're, so they're, they're specifically interested in arguing that uh, for the emergence of mental features. Okay, it's not a surprise. This is, this is most of the time why people are emergentists today. They're, they don't think we need emergence for, to understand chemistry or biology. It's consciousness, usually. So this is what, this is what they're concerned about. So the peas are supposed to be, uh, uh, describing physical states or phys the sensation of physical features, and then the E would be the emergent features, with, which they really think is is their mental features. So, so what's the problem? So we Sorry, have I just want to know how meant to think of the difference between P star and E one. It's P star and E, yeah. Or the one below it. Well, it's star. just that the, the thought is there are physical there are physical laws. So in uh, in Broad's terminology, those would be intraordinal laws. But then when you have a certain physical arrangement with a certain level of complexity, a certain specific kind of complexity, then you're going to have the emergence of a, of a new feature. And that, is a, that's, that cannot be captured by the, the, physical, the physical laws. So the so laws governing. P1 and P star are like different levels of organization, like atoms and molecules. Uh, so this P1, there's a P1 here. Yeah, and the one uh, about it. Well, I just want to know what the difference P1 between P1 and P star. Right, so let me just see. Let me just hold on one sec. Uh, so they need, right, okay, good. Uh, yeah, so this I didn't explain. So the thought is that it's too simplistic to say that um, so I think the ats here are supposed to be background conditions to actually get this causation. So there's going to be like a certain physical feature. In this case, yeah, it looks like it's just P star alone that is causing E. But to get the continuation of P star, you're always going to need some kind of, uh, you know, some interesting physical feature and also some kind of background conditions to sustain that. Uh, so like if it's, you know, let's say P star is the arrangement of, uh, of, of cells in the brain, then to get that continuing, you're going to need to have, you know, oxygen in your blood and, and things like that. So these are, these are the physical laws that are going to keep having that kind of complex physical system persisting over time. And the one of these are properties at different levels of organization? So, they're describing this as, uh, where did I see? Uh, they're, they're describing these E's and P stars and everything as states. But we can just think about states as the instantiation of a particular feature. So is it a physical feature or not? So P star and E, those are all supposed to be states. So it's, but you can think of, I'm talking so about like the instantiation. Of states in terms of molecules, is that the one These are going to be, no, these are going to be, it's, Fine. Um, so this is definitely, P star will be the state of a complex system, so presumably at least describing a brain, right? Um, and then since these are states that are going to be sustaining that P star for the next time, these are also going to be states of complex systems, right? This is going to be, uh, you know, the kind of what is required to have a brain, for you to have a brain at the next time. Uh, okay. So all of these are, I, I, in this particular diagram, all of these are states of complex systems. It's just that they're not, they're, they're states of complex systems that are perfectly understandable, explainable by the physical laws. What's not, if you're ever, I mean, you can reject this and say, no, there's something, we don't need this, but, but the thought is that there are these, there are these features or, or I mean, states are just a sensation of features that are not predictable from the physical laws alone that um, that require these these new kinds of uh, causal relationships, and so that's what that's what that is. Okay. Yeah, I think the said that the the emerging the very metaphysical emergences the yeah. concerns that the causal powers uh, can't be reduced. To the, uh, yeah, so this so, is an so, example of this right here. So, so not every, not all the British emergentists, or not all the emergentists agree with this. 
but this is an explicit part of O'Connor and Wong because they think it's very important if we're going to get consciousness, the consciousness should also have these causal powers. So that's this. So you have E with these other physical features together causing a new, a new property to emerge, or, well, new, causing a new state which involves a new uh, merchant property. Right, but, but so then is that original formulation uh, to say that like at, at a specific time it's not producible? Because it seems like uh, uh, O'Connor and Wong are giving a causal history where everything uh -huh. is possible to the basis of features. No, it's not, it, it, so it depends on how you're thinking about reduction, but uh, it's not the case that by, so let me just go back here. Uh, it's not the case that given the lower uh, levels of complexity and boundary conditions involving the arrangement of particles, <coughs> you can deduce, and this, by this I think they mean just the laws of the lower levels. So those would be like P, you know, just the, the physical laws that you would be able to deduce, deduce uh, that this that this happens. So that's that's the thought. Um, I'm not trying to convince you to be an emergentist. I'm definitely not an emergentist. But that's that's the idea. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now they also say so. Now we know this may result in downward ca in downward causation. Um, that's not really like the key thing that they're interested in when they want to say these new emergent features have causal powers. They want to say right the we're not epiphenomenalists about consciousness. But the, there, you remember, since they have these super emergent features, they can say these new uh, emergent features do have new causal powers in causing this. Uh, that doesn't mean that there's downward causation. Downward causation is another issue, right? So I think, where is it? Where? This. So. Well, they didn't draw any down. Oh, yeah, here we go. Here's downward causation from E and this other stuff to a new physical fact. You can have that too. That's, that's compatible with the account, but that's not a necessary uh, feature of it. That's not like what's motivating the account. And then they say, and does, does, yeah. Is the downward causation just like spoil yeah. the determinism of the law? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so the. Uh, <coughs> There's no threat of epiphenomenalism or exclusion. Uh, I'll sh show you this argument in a second for why you might think that the, 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 the standard emergentism does. So let me just quickly, we have these distinctions in the, in the literature that um, I think are useful, so I'm just putting them, these labels out there. This, you might see people talk about strong, weak, strong or weak emergence. This is, this is what we usually have in mind. Um, so this is how Mark Bedow makes his distinction. So there's nominal emergence, where, where we say nominal emergence. Emergence in name only, right? This isn't really emergence. Uh, where you just have res resultant macro features that cannot be micro features. So here, when Bedow talks about nominal emergence, he has in mind features like shape. So you say, well, your electrons and quarks can have shapes. But then you think, but they can compose objects that do have shapes. Does that mean that shape's an, uh, an emergent feature? Well, oh, I wanted to talk about this in the beginning, in the very beginning. Notice on my, the list of uh, emergentist theses, I didn't mention novelty. That is something that sometimes, you know, that comes up in the context of emergentism. But I didn't put this as one of the theses because novelty is not that interesting. So the fact that, that, the, the fact that you, just novelty, mere novelty, just the fact that there are certain features of a complex system that couldn't be had by features of the constituents, like shape, doesn't necessarily mean there's anything, that there's anything interesting going on, at least given the way that this, uh, the way that this emergentism discussion has been going on since the 19th century. Since Mill, there is a, already a distinction between resultant features and emergent features, where the resultant features might be novel in the sense that there are features that couldn't be had by the components. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's still resultant features, right? They are still resultant features. 
So uh, this is what uh, Badal has in mind by just nominal emergence. So you have a novelty, but it's, there's still just resultant features of, and he's specifically interested in the relationship between macro and, and micro. Strong, where strong emergence is where, in this situation, like O'Connor and Wong is like the clearest case of this. We have novel causal powers, and then weak emergence would be an intermediate case where it's not that the features are merely resultant, so you still are going to need new laws in order to accommodate the, the existence of these new kinds of features, but it doesn't mean that they, these new features bring with them novel causal powers, like we had in the O'Connor and Long case. Eleanor Taylor uh, has, uh, has a nice article, uh, I have the I'll have the references at the end here, where some, you know, you might worry, well, okay, so I'm talking about, I've talked about how philosophers think about emergence since Mill, but does that necessarily mean that that's how scientists think, are thinking about it? When we talk about emergence, we're philosophers of science. We want to talk about it, how the scientists talk about emergence, not some stupid philosopher's mind. Uh, <laughs> Chris said that to me. Uh, <laughs> paper called An Explication of Emergence, where she goes through examples from chemistry, from uh, condensed matter physics, from artificial life, and, and, and shows that the kind of language they use when they're talking about emergence and complex systems is the same as this language that were using. Uh, but I wanted to put the philosophy parts up here, not the so uh, just really quickly, there's an uh, argument to why are people not emergentists today? Uh, you know, most, most, most philosophers of mind uh, were not emergentists because there are arguments against it on the one hand. Uh, so uh, Jaguan Kim uh, has a nice paper, I guess I mentioned it already, called Making Sense of Emergence. And at the very end of the paper, he gives an argument against this that is very similar to his exclusion uh, problem is the supervenience argument um, that he gave against non-reductive physicalism. And so, you know, he's just saying, again, you know, assume that emergent features are causally efficacious and they're uh, supervenient and they're yet not identical to physical features. Well, then you can always ask, right, if you have supervenience, so when you have this emergent feature instantiated at a time you also have, because there's supervenience, you're also going to have to have this physical feature instantiated at this time. Well, how could the emergent feature be causally efficacious? Because it seems like anything that it could cause, it seems like there's also this other cause here, P, that could potentially exclude it from, from causal relevance. And so the response, I, I mentioned earlier quickly that uh, O'Connor and Wong think that their view avoids this problem. They're very explicit about this, and the reason is because they're denying, they deny supervenience. So for them, they say, well, it's not that this is this P that is from which E is emerging happens at this time, T1. There's going to be some earlier time where P, where P occurs. And so you can't say, well, why is E, why I think that E causes this effect isn't, isn't isn't E, why does it C here? This is supposed to be the effect, so it has to be that. Uh, why well, I think that E causes this thing, we should think P does, but P's not, the, 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 the P that's giving rise to E isn't at the same time as T1. So they think that this helps us say, well, there is a causal, there is a causal chain that's like this, and so they avoid this exclusion problem. Uh, but there is another argument for, uh, against emergentism, which is McLaughlin's at the end of his British emergentist paper, which is just like, why would I be an emergentist? Uh, there's no evidence for this. Uh, and so we've been, you know, the, the argument is more than that. It's like, well, we've been extremely successful in using the physical laws to explain what a lot of what the British emergentists thought we couldn't explain. So yeah, they didn't have quantum mechanics, so it was very difficult to understand chemistry why chemical reactions occur. Now, now we have that. Now we can now we we have more explanations. We we similarly, you know, develop molecular biology that's 
serving to, to help us not um, not be emergentists in the case of biology and so on. So why what's the evidence what's the evidence to think that consciousness now is something special we need to be emergentists for this case? Uh, I want to talk like, before we get to the issue about space time, I just briefly want to mention this issue about fundamentality. So there's always been this puzzle, I think, lurking for like what is going on with emergentism. So the emergent phenomena are supposed to <coughs> depend on these basic phenomena, they're supposed to result from them, yet they're at the same time also supposed to be autonomous, right? That's why we're counting them as emergent, not just mere effects of other physical phenomena. So they depend, but also they don't depend on our basic phenomena. Like, what is the view? Elizabeth Barnes has a really nice paper uh, from 2012 called Emergency Fundamentality, where she argues that, yes, we need to tease apart the kind of the dependence in the sense in which emergent phenomena are supposed to depend on underlying phenomena and the sense in which there's, they're not supposed to depend, they're supposed to be autonomous. And so the argument here is that there's one issue, which is dependence. And so she characterizes that this way, and to be X is dependent on entities Y1 through YN, just in case X is both caused and sustained by the Ys. Uh, and, then, and then there's an issue about fundamentality. And so the claim that she wants to make is that if you're going to be an emergentist, your view should be that the emergent features are dependent on the uh, basal features from which they emerge, but they're also fundamental. And what's fundamental, now this is slippery, There's, we can't give a definition, she doesn't try to offer a definition of fundamentality. She characterizes it in two ways that are not my favorite ways. Uh, but let me just say, this is, so this is me, this is not Barnes. The way that Barnes characterizes fundamentality is in terms of two, so there's first this theological metaphor that people like to use. So the fundamental features are the features that when God created the world, that's all he had to create. Um, okay, so there's that. So you can think about fundamentality that way. Once he created those features, that was it. I don't really get that that's what's going on. I don't think that's even helpful in this case, honestly, because if these are emergent features that are emerging from the physical features, then it seems like God didn't need to create the emergent features. Uh, he could have just created. But the other way that she suggests we think about this, which is more helpful if you are of this kind of persuasion, and uh, can you get that back? I'm sorry. I can't. I would do it myself, but I don't think I have enough guns. Um, the other way that she recommends we think about fundamentality is, and I'm, I'm sure I did that, but, uh, is in terms of truth making. So you can say, look, there are all the kind of truths that hold at our world, and the fundamental is what uh, provides the truth, what, what serves as the truth makers for all the truths. So that's that's a little bit better. But you know, here are some other here's some other ways to think about fundamentality. So you can think about the fundamental as what exists objectively, not relative to somebody's perspective, because they're just it's just objectively there. The basic joints in nature, those are the fundamental, uh, the intrinsic structure of reality. Uh, this is a little bit better, so you could say if you want a complete description of the world, you're, this is what you're going to have to include. So this is, I think, makes sense because the emergentist is thinking that you need new laws in order to capture the, um, the fact that you have these emergent features. So if you're going to have a complete description, it's not enough just to use the physical laws. To include the physical laws in that description, you're going to need these, um, or you know, if you want to call them intraorbital or homopathic laws, you're also going to need to include these laws of emergence or transorbital or heteropathic laws. Um, and another way to think about this is just as lacking a metaphysical explanation. So the, the fundamental features are those that, although they're real, have no uh, grounding explanation. So a lesson just here is, if you want to think about, if you think this makes sense, this is the right way to think about emergence. So you have this kind of dependence, but right, they're depend the, the emergent features are dependent on some underlying features. So maybe there are new laws that are governing that emergence. The emergent features are still, they're fundamental, right? They're part of these additional, they're, they're governed by these additional uh, fundamental laws. 
then you shouldn't be talking about the way that I think we often do, na naively, talk about a, like a, I think there's a fundamentally emergent dichotomy. And I think I even talked like this in the beginning, even though I knew that I was going to say this. Uh, don't talk about the emergent it, emerging from the fundamental. It's, no, if you're saying it's emergent, then you're saying it's fundamental too. Uh, Rasmus? Um, no, that's fine. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. last thing on, on reduction. Uh, I don't want to talk, you know, we can talk about reduction for hours and hours and hours. So I don't want to do that. Uh, but I do want to mention just this, that you know, Mill is working with a particular kind of distinction between the resultant features and the uh, heteropathic features. Resultant effects of, of, uh, of complex systems and then, and then heteropathic effects. Those are, that are due to heteropathic laws. And he talks about, you know, when he's illustrating this, there was what he means by resultant, he talks about vector addition. don't think that's the way we should be thinking about this. I mean, we should broaden our understanding of what would be, what is meant by a mere resultant feature. What is meant at, by a mere resultant feature. And the natural thing to say is, well, since Mill, we've had other models of reduction. So a couple days ago, I talked about a functional model of reduction. So this is another way of seeing the features of a given, of a given complex system as not requiring new laws, right, to understand how they're there, but we can see them as being the results of some kind of uh, causal behavior and the more fundamental features. And so we have um, we have other other alternative ways to, to understand the relationship of complex systems uh, to the underlying of uh, 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 metaphysics. Uh, I also wanted, uh, well, I wanted to put up this uh, this this image, as I think this is this is important in seeing that the issue of reduction versus emergence isn't just a isn't a sharp you know it is it, there, it isn't a sharp dichotomy. So reduction permits many different forms. And that comes about because, for example, when we're doing a functional reduction, you might have a kind of function, causal functional role that's associated with a given phenomenon, and yet you can't exactly see the, your uh, more basic ontology as playing exactly that causal role. And so just because that's the case, it doesn't necessarily mean we have emergence. It doesn't necessarily necessarily mean that what we're going to say is, oh, so there must be some new fundamental laws here um, relating the, the basal features to these emerging features. What we could say is, well, we're wrong about some of, what we, some of the features we thought uh, the allegedly emergent higher order uh, features were supposed to have. Uh, so this is a point that's familiar just from the literature on intertheoretic reduction uh, from uh, Hooker and Schaffner, uh, Churchland, they all, all their models of reduction incorporate this idea. Uh, John Bickle in his book, Psychoneural Reduction, had a nice image that I was not able to snatch off Google, which is frustrating, but I, so I recreated it for you. And the way he just thinks about this is there is this, uh, Continuum of different um, different uh, ways reduction can go from a situation where you have perfect retention of the uh, phenomenon you wanted to reduce to a situation where you have total replacement or elimination. The reduction is always involving explanation, but in some cases it might be more of an explaining away. Uh, and this corresponds to if you want to think about reduction in terms of derivations. Uh, uh, in the perfect retention case, you have a really smooth derivation. In the total replacement case, what you're going to have is a very bumpy derivation, meaning you're not exactly going to, uh, the derivation isn't from your original base theory to the theory that, that, that you started with of the, the higher order, uh, allegedly higher order phenomenon. And he's got these, so this is supposed to be, I mean, these are his examples. Uh, so this is supposed to be physical optics and electromagnetism and Kepler's laws and Newtonian mechanics, 
Uh, this is supposed to be on the smooth side, but the uh, orbits aren't perfectly elliptical here, so it's just a little. Uh, and then thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, and this is uh, phlogiston chemistry and oxygen chemistry. But I obviously don't want to be in those examples and where they fall in the continuum. Uh, okay, so on to, to quantum gravity. So I just, uh, I don't know. So I, maybe Kyle just showed me that uh, the emergence group was reading this uh, Oribe paper and the disappearance and emergence of space and time and quantum gravity. I think this is like a good example of somebody struggling with this idea of do we really want to talk about emergence here? Uh, so the LA says one problematic point is whether or not the supposedly emergent property of the system one wants to describe can be reduced to properties of more fundamental constituents of the same system and whether or not the theoretical description of such an emergent property can be deduced from the theoretical description of the fundamental constituents. <coughs> there are known microscopic derivations of macroscopic phenomena, small-scale justifications of large-scale effects, even if these reductions may not always be complete, rigorous, analytic, or even sometimes useful in practice. Okay, so he's saying, like, don't say, we never have reduction. But some people want to say that. But he's saying if the answer is roughly speaking positive, so we do have reductions, they might not be complete rigorous in uh, What does it mean that something is emergent at all? Does not reducibility of properties to one another imply that the one deduction starts from is the real or truly fundamental one? So what I'm trying to do in this whole presentation, I mean, I'm, I think we should have a discussion about this, but my original thought was yes. The answer is yes. Um, yes, you don't have emergence. <laughs> uh, but no. We align with Butterfield and collaborators in understanding emergence to mean, and this is this is what something you did say. Uh, so we align with Butterfield and collaborators in understanding emergence to mean the appearance of properties of a system that are novel with respect to other descriptions of the same system. For example, at different scales or in different approximations or with different macroscopic constraints and robust in the sense of being reproducible and stable, thus systematically observed, at least in principle. Deducing the emergence of some property requires, in general, a limiting procedure in terms of some parameter of the system which leads to a new feature, a new feature that was not present in the description of the system before the limit. This does not imply that the property exists only for the system at the limit or that the limit system is real, as in many cases this would be physically untenable. Here enters the second key notion of approximation. Emergent behavior, even when it's identified or deduced via a limiting procedure, occurs physically before the actual limit is reached, provided it's approached enough in some sense that varies from case to case. It's this emergent behavior close to the limit which is real. The typical example is phase transitions in condensed matter systems, and then that's pretty much the end. He just talks about phase transitions as well. Um, so you might ask, is this an additional variety of emergence that I just didn't consider, but again, we're talking about novelty. Novelty isn't really enough, at least for folks who have discussed emergence, to say now we're dealing with an emergent feature. Resultant features can be considered novel as well. And when McLaughlin mentions, and so I repeated this a couple times and went back to the passage um, at a certain point, thinking, uh, when, when Jeremy was asked me this question, uh, the thought is that when we're talking about what, whether or not we can derive a given phenomenon, reduce a given phenomenon to some basal conditions, those are including any kind of boundary conditions that you want to put on it. So I don't think that this is really a reason to say, oh, we know we really mean emergence and emergence is compatible with reduction. I think that just makes things really confusing to people that are not philosophers who are wondering, like, well, what do you mean when you're talking about emergence? You're the philosopher, explain that to me. If we can say there's reduction and then there's emergence, that's just, I think that is a lot, that's a lot clearer. We have these kinds of, this pretty well unified account. All right, but that's it, that's just my plea. Uh, there are different kinds of approaches, I think, you know, depending on how you are going to be uh, addressing space-time uh, in quantum gravity, you're going to have different approaches. Some are going to look like emergence, some are not going to look like emergence. Uh, that looks like identity to me. 
but uh, <laughs> not emergence. But that's what I wanted. I was hoping maybe um, uh, Chris can have a discussion about that. Uh, are there any just questions about this? What I or objections? So yeah, questions about the talk first, and then maybe space time. Space time. Oh yeah. So I'm just wondering. Um, it seems like it might be useful to have a characterization at the outset of what it means for a set of features to be basal. Yeah. To some other yeah. Um, putatively emergent features, because like I guess um, mentioned in all the yes. various um, theses. Um, but it seems like that might be difficult uh, in the case of space time where we don't have that straightforward composition relation available to us. So I wonder. Like, if it would be useful in the first place, and then second, like, that's going to be a problem. We would want that to just be able to have some neutral uh, characterization. Just first of all, what does it mean for some users to be basal? Yeah, so I don't think that the emergentist or, you know, just a philosopher of science wanting to, you know, characterize what we mean by reduction emergence needs to have a general account of. A general account, yes and no. I think in some sense they don't have to have a general account of basal conditions because what we're trying to do is just give a conceptual framework for then folks who want to talk about, you know, I've given an emergence of, sorry, I've given, I provided a reduction of thermodynamics from statistical mechanics or a reduction of, or, an, or I've shown that space time is emergent from um, some kind of uh, 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 theory of spin networks or something like that. Theory of spin networks, they are going to determine like what they what they mean and they say it in a particular case. What are you using to 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 affect the reduction? Uh, what are what is the, the the theory that you're saying that um, or what is a phenomenon? Depending, you know, if you want to talk about that in a ontological way, that that you're claiming that space time is emerging from. So I want to, I mean I think we should just leave that open. Whatever they they want to say, but. Um, there was the one point where um, this mattered, uh, where it does matter to characterizations of reduction about whether or not the basal conditions include just laws or whether they include something else. So they have to include at least like states, right? Uh, not just laws, but I think it would be states, including background conditions and laws. Those could all be included in the basal conditions, and then whatever I mean, whatever else. I mean. Symmetry is something else. Uh, whatever is included in that theory, it's not just the laws. Uh, those would be the basal conditions. Uh, but it's up to whoever wants to affect the, the reduction or argue for the emergence to specify what this thing is supposed to be emerging from or reducible to. Is, is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, like, say you have like a really um, strong uh, metaphysical. Case of emergence for such a reduction is just not available. Yeah. Um, like what would be what would be involved in saying that one is emergent from the other and they're not just two like independent sets of features? Um, yeah. Well it's you the, have like an idea of what it means for one to be basal with respect to the other. Well the reason why they're supposed to be not the reason why the emergent is thinks they're not separate is because they're the, the emergence involves this law. So there's a new law. So it's not like for Descartes, you have the, you have the material world and then you have um, the, the minds. Um, it's, I mean, there you obviously you, know, you have causal interaction in that case, but um, it's not that the way that, it's not that the minds are coming from the material, and in this case it is. So there's, there's supposed to be these, always these transordinal laws or heteropathic laws, whatever you want to say, that, that tie one to the other. And that's in their tradition, not separate. Another, another thing, though I don't think this, I don't know exactly how this is supposed to apply in the, in the space-time piece, is that usually people are talking about emergent features, and so they'll be, um, they won't be substance dualists, if say they're emergent is about consciousness, they'll still say it's all just matter, but there are these new emergent features. Uh, beyond the you know, mass and spin and charge and the rest of the physical features. Uh, for charmers, it'll be like whatever the fundamental objects are, the fundamental particles also have 
uh, these phenomenal features. And so, yeah, it's a two. There are these laws that are relating the instantiation of one to the instantiation of, of the other, and also they're both features of the same kinds of material objects. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the same way, there are different solutions and images. There are different notions of fundamental. Yeah. So maybe it would be good uh, help to distinguish between the notion, for example, I'm thinking about the other suspicions of the Grandi, so like uh, explanations, connecting parts of explanations. But that was part of what I wanted to, I mean, that was part of what I thought was a good job about fundamentality. Because I mean that's what's being claimed in the uh, that's what's being claimed in the uh, in the case of production. I mean, right? Uh, let's see how far I can do this. Yes. Uh, so in the I mean that's I took it that I mean that was one of the core metaphysical claims. So here I didn't say novelty. The claim was that emergent features, unlike those that are mere, merely resultant, right, which could be novel too, are neither metaphysically explainable nor reducible to. So they don't, so they're fundamental because they're not grounded in. I mean, by metaphysical explanation, you know, I just mean grounded, so they're, just, they're not grounded in. Yeah, because we have also the idea that, well, once again, they're fundamental in the more ontological sense. Like, you know, there's a mystery of dependent, there's a situation of building relations, yeah. many dependent building relations, many yeah. entities. Um, well, I didn't get why I put the third I think. I don't I mean, the relative entities in this sense, um, in this sense are not fundamental. Uh, so there's, there are aspects of, we can get into the normal metaphysics here, but um, the, the, uh, the um, I think if you, if you start to have like Karen Bennett's framework, then this is much more difficult to like get clear on what emergence is. Because, she, I mean, she, her talk of building, she thinks, does she still think this? I, I mean, I've seen her present uh, papers where she's got this like smooth, Transition between grounding and causation. So it's not like causation is one thing and grounding is something else. There are these intermediate cases. When you start to have that, then this breaks down. But I, I mean, that's not really, I don't know how many people have that view. I think it's really interesting. But then once, I mean, once you start to do that, then yeah, I mean, this, I think this, this breaks down and the kind of, uh, the kind of clarity that Elizabeth Barnes, like, Gives to the to, to like what emergence is, um, you, you you just can't you can't have that because for her like dependence is this causal causal dependence uh, or nomological dependence, and then the fundamentality of the emergent is uh, metaphysical independence. I guess I mean, she doesn't use that word. Yet. Geometro 
Genesis, or I don't know how to use that. I'm trying to uh, say that. Uh, he talks about that as phase transitions. I think, I mean, it might be just more useful to, you know, just not to try to think about that as a case of emergence, at least in the way that all of these other emergences have talked about that, and just understand that it's like, a case of reduction. It's, more, um, you know, it's less puzzling. Um, so I have a thought or question. I hope it comes out in a good way. It's not going to be great about it. Um, I'm noticing a lot of, uh, at least my own reaction to uh, a lot of this conversation, or the motivating intuitions that go into these uh, definitions and discussions uh, seem to relate in an interesting way to uh, the near observational fact that different uh, scientific communities have very different explanatory norms. And I guess I, I'm wondering uh, to what extent uh, there's an interesting question, not so much what uh, metaphysical features of the world are uh, emerging, so to speak, um, so much as whether the uh, sort of thing which constitutes a sufficient explanation on one level is what we want to be or or yeah. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah. yeah I think that in all I've read about this, I really feel like maybe Anderson is left, but I feel like that's just left out. I feel like that is I, so I don't um, I, I mean I don't I don't think that, that I mean, I don't see that as motivating the discussion, but I think like that would be a reasonable thing to motivate to motivate a discussion. Um, it's interesting how that would. Oh, but not actually, if it's on the slide, I want it. Um, so I feel like yeah, um, where we talk about. Explanation here. Uh, it, I mean, we're assuming that there's just like, and th these discussions are assuming like there's causal explanation. We know what that is, uh, <laughs> and that's what the explanations are that 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 these laws are, you know, describing. But once you start to think, well, there could be different kinds of explanation. Then I think this kind of explanatory thesis looks more. Uh, the analog of that, whatever that uh, that explanatory thesis would look like, would look more more plausible. Uh, you need new kinds of explanations to accommodate the sciences, and so uh, you, you. I don't know. I mean, I was thinking that even if you had this explanatory thesis, there is still like a metaphysical oomph to it because you're still saying like there are new there are new laws that aren't being captured, and so the, and so you still have to talk about you know there's still going to be uh, additional fundamental ideology at least um, right, but uh, uh, yeah. So what you're saying would be a way to be an emergentist without necessarily having any kind of maybe there wouldn't be new methods. Maybe you'd say, well, there are other kinds of explanation. That doesn't mean that there are new fundamental laws or anything like that. It's just there are different kinds of explanation. And so uh, this would be a way to be an emergentist without, at the same time, having any of these metaphysical uh, conclusions. Uh, I, yeah, so that maybe that should be just left open as another, as another alternative way to say what's going on in these kinds of cases that we're interested in. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Alex, sorry. Uh, did you get a follow-up? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I had a follow-up. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, because I was wondering, um, actually, it's more just a thought. Um, when we were talking, you know, with all the different emergencies and the presented and stuff like that, those, you know, whatever you think about, you know, whether or not you should be emerging just with respect to, like, physics, chemistry, biology, and yeah. so forth, um, those were all instances in which um, two domains of empirical content I had, you know, the sort of development of the respective sciences, and then we went to try to compare them. But with respect to something like quantum gravity, yeah. we don't have like a specific domain of empirical content that is independent of the current, right. you know, domain that has its own special science that's developed, and therefore that we want to. We're we're simply yeah. trying to go deeper with respect to our own empirical content. Yeah. So I'm wondering if we even need with respect to quantum gravity. Yeah. To come to a decision about whether or not we're going to psychologists. 
Oh, no. No, absolutely not. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm talking about, uh, you know, in some places, the examples that I'm using are examples of people who are emergentists. And um, so they they're, they think that, I mean, the, there were the, the ones from the early 20th century that thought that chemistry was emergent. There's, there are those from today that think that consciousness is emergent. But I think we can talk about emergence and reduction without, I mean, yeah, we don't have to take any stance on that. I mean, it's case, you do case by case. Uh, yeah, but I just wonder it's a very different sort of situation. We're not, there's no. It's a different situation. There's no empirical thing we can point to and say, we need to explain this. It's, we're looking at physics from a theoretical perspective, and we're not satisfied with what we have. Does that make sense? Um, but I still think these, I mean, the issues of reduction and, and emergence latch on. Like, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with Haridi that it's, it's right to, I'm not disagreeing with him um, that just talk about reduction emergence is, um, is apt here. I think, I think what we're dealing with are, there are, different, there are different frameworks that have different descriptions, and different ontologies, uh, different, different um, uh, 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 the constraints, and, and then we're asking about whether or not we could have some kind of uh, relation, you know, between the two. That's that is reductive or, or not. Uh, I think I, I take, take the point that um, we're in a different. In this case, there's it's a, it's definitely different because. It's not like we're dealing with two sciences that developed independently of each other. Instead, we're dealing with two, well, niches, like, or really, I mean, approaches, like, within, within physics, one of which developed completely consciously with the idea of, <laughs> uh, right, of relating to this other one. And so there's definitely, a, there is definitely a different situation. Um, I mean, it's different enough that you would, I think you would ask yourself, like, why would you think there is emergence in this case situation at all? Like, just cook up your theory in such a way that you can have the emergence of rejection. But I don't want to talk about it yet. But, but yeah, I still think these, these concepts are apt. Uh, what time? I think we have to start stop at this point and maybe come back to the question of the emergence of space, then we'll uh, the, the relative discussion. Okay. This afternoon. Before you go, I mean. This question? Go ahead. With the hand up, I'll pass some post its around so you can break the question down right now and not forget it. Um, stick it on the board and we'll, we'll, we'll pick these up at the round table this afternoon for the yeah. discussion. Um, these will go around as well. People can put other questions, but I thought. I saw some hands down here, but we should say Okay, thank you very much.